for the Rebel Media. I'm Ezra Levant. I am standing in the precincts of the Mother of Parliaments here in the United Kingdom, and standing with me is Lord Pearson of Rannoch. What a pleasure to meet you in your home turf. The, the honor is entirely mine. Well, come now. That's <laughs> uh, nice of you to say. What was so interesting to me is that you're a peer, you're a member of the House of Lords, and yet you are friends with someone that some would say is on the opposite end of the spectrum from you in many walks of life. I'm talking about Tommy Robinson. How did that unlikely friendship come about? Well, I, I can't remember. I remember now how Tommy and I met. I was asking one of my questions in, in the Lords, um, really trying to talk about Islam. And I was um, trying to find out, ask publicly, whether to, to, to um, talk about Islam, to try and understand Islam, the tenets of Islam and all that, uh, constituted hate speech. And um, Tommy heard about this, and, and, and so he decided to come and listen. Mm. And he was supposed to go into the public gallery, as, as I understood it, but of course he met up with some of my friends, and before we knew where we were, he was in the Distinguished Visitors Gallery, in the front row, in front of the Liberal Democrat Party, <laughs> who all got extremely jumpy about the oh. whole thing. And then I had such a rough ride in that particular question, um, which I think has gone on YouTube and that sort of thing, uh, that when Tommy came to me and said, I'd like to interview, I said, yes, Tommy, come on, let's do an interview. So we went and did an interview together, which, which isn't very good, but it's got some good parts in it. And I met him, and I met a most remarkable man. Uh, I, I met someone who's not at all um, what the mainstream media and the idiotic political establishment everything would, would have you believe. Um, I met the man of his, I don't know, his speech to the Oxford Union. Uh, I've read his autobiography, Enemy of the State. And I've also... I, I'm, it's such a work of Muslim Islamic scholarship that I couldn't possibly read it, but I have looked at his book, um, which he co-authored with Peter McLaughlin. Mohammed's Quran. Uh, Mohammed's Quran, Quran yeah. which is a terribly important book because it attempts to put the Quran into chronological order. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, if, if you can't understand the basic and terrifying Muslim tenet of abrogation, whereby the later verses of the Quran outweigh and cancel the later violent verses of the sword, the verses post Medina, um, uh, uh, cancel the earlier verses of, 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 of peace. Um, if you don't understand that, you can't really begin to understand Islam. So it's a hugely important book. So I, I met a most uh, exceptional man, and, uh, and, uh, and I don't give a damn where he comes from, and he doesn't give a damn where I come from. And we made friends, and it's as simple as that. Your observations about Tommy, mm. I share them and other people share them. Mm. But typically, I find in the United Kingdom, especially in politics, in mm. the media, in s polite company, people may think those thoughts, but if they dare say them out loud, they're marginalized yeah. and deep, unpersoned. Is it only because you have the uh, unshakable seat in the House of Lords that you, that you can say these things with impunity? Oh, yes, I think some of the things I've said um, in the Lords, which I say under privilege, parliamentary privilege, I can't actually be arrested for what I say in the Lords. Um, but when, for instance, the other day I made the simplest of comments, I said in the House was full, and I just said, my Lord, since nowadays most terrorists are Islamists. And the place erupted. Um, but that's incontrovertible. That's a mathematical you'd have thought, question. You'd have thought, but uh, also saying, um, uh, pointing out that our grooming gang scandal in this country, which is a colossal scandal. I mean, yesterday uh, I, I challenged the government with the fact that if you extrapolate the towns and areas where we have official and semi-official figures, if you extrapolate those figures nationally, we're looking at 250,000 girls, minimum, raped this century. We're looking at between five and eight million rapes um, by Muslim men, okay, that's the point, um, the, the, um, of these girls. Um, and some would say, I don't know enough about it, they're sanctioned in the Quran by uh, what your right hand uh, possesses. Um, and, 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 and so on. I, I don't know whether it is or not, but I want to talk about it. I don't want to, to go on being told that I can't talk about it. And as you say, as soon as you mention it in polite society or anywhere talking to normal people, they just switch off. Not, they assume, but this is a great conundrum, 
they assume that because most of the Muslims we know, and we all know lots of them, they are peaceful people, praying, giving alms, and so because they are peaceful, so must the um, Muslim religion be peaceful. And it isn't necessarily the same thing at all. Mm. There's a distinction between criticizing Islam, the doctrine, the philosophy, of the course. religion, yeah. and criticizing an individual Muslim. Of course. I think some people are afraid that if you criticize the doctrine, you're necessarily condemning individual people. Well, that's what they people. say. They always throw it at me. They say, come on, you're you know, condemning millions of innocent people. I mean, I do say, en passant there, that only 8% of the um, um, tip-offs to our police and various programs we've got against Islam, and so only 8% come within our very close-knit Muslim communities. Mm. So one does slightly say, if only 1% of these people are the violent sort, what the hell are the other 99% doing about mm. it? Well, one could ask for more of that. But I have never criticized, my, I've got Muslim friends, and we don't, and Tommy doesn't, and Jared doesn't, and other people. I don't criticize Muslims uh, as such. I want to know about their religion, mm. and I want to know where it may lead when, um, for instance, in 15 years, a dozen or so of our local authorities in this country are going to be um, Muslim majority, because the Muslim birth rate, and I have government answers to show this, the Muslim birth rate is going up at about 10 times the national birth rate, the non-Muslim birth rate. Now that's quite worrying, because when they become a majority, and, and, and all Muslims have a duty to live under Sharia law, they have to follow the Quran and the doings and sayings of the Prophet, what's going to happen? I don't know, but I think it's better we start talking about it now. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how Islam is so connected to free speech, because any other ideology, capitalism, socialism, communism, Christianity, is open for criticism. Some no, it's communism on... wasn't. <laughs> oh, that's One true. word against that, eight years in the gulag, oh. mate. So, you know. <laughs> well, that's a good point. We, ha we had a denazification after yeah. the Second World War. Yeah, yeah, we didn't yeah. have a decommunization after no, the fall no, of the Berlin no, Wall. No, yeah. But you're not even allowed to... Are you allowed to criticize Islam in the public square in the United Kingdom? Well, I don't know, but I, I, you, you, you... Can you name someone who does, who's not a Muslim himself? I, I see Majid Nawaz yes. of the Quilliam Foundation has some courage. Yep. Do you have to be he, Muslim? He's the to, sort of person we'd really want to encourage, and the Quilliam. If you're that. not Muslim yourself, is there? can you name someone other than yourself and maybe Tommy in the center of public conversation, in the public square, who can do it? Or are you instantly unpersoned? Well, I've been unpersoned, but that doesn't worry me. If I'm unpersoned by this lot, I regard it as rather a compliment. Mm. It doesn't worry me at all. <laughs> but I think I am the only member of either House of Parliament um, who has tried to talk about Islam um, since Winston Churchill in 1896 or something like well, he's that. He's being unpersoned retroactively, isn't he? Yeah, but what he had to say was actually quite interesting and it's worth a read. What did he say? Some well, I can't read, well, he said he was quite... Um, he was quite precise and negative about the Mohammedans and that their whole business of inshallah and the rest of it led them to be rather lazy and not to... Um, it's worth a read, it's one paragraph. Uh, but so I'm the only person who's been doing it and um, I've got quite a few people, um, peers and things, who privately say to me, we think what you're doing is so valuable, thank you very much, you know, we're right behind you, you're frightfully brave and so on, so, so, so forth. To which I say, well, yeah, you may be right behind me, but you seem quite a long way behind me. Yeah. Because when I have one of these questions, most of them aren't even in the chamber, uh, you know. A lot of us in North America watched with admiration as Nigel Farage led the Brexit referendum. And it was a premonition of the Donald Trump phenomenon, many of us think. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all give credit to Nigel Farage for that. And, and we say this as outsiders. We don't know yeah, the yeah, internal yeah. dealings. No, he deserves it fully. Yeah. He, he stays away from the Islam issue very, very assiduously. Um, is there a political force you said you're the only one in either House of Parliament. Is there a force that will talk about these the way there are in some continental European countries, where it's Marine Le Pen or yeah. Matteo Salvini yeah. or, or the Alternative for Deutschland? Is there a force in the United Kingdom that will talk about these in a responsible, mainstream way like ought to be done? Well, we're, on, on the Nigel point, 
I mean, I, you're absolutely right, Nigel is the hero of Brexit. Uh, he deserves a dukedom for what he did. Um, and it's understandable that Nigel wants to see that through uh, and that he sees Islam as something of um, a diversion, which is possibly a little ahead of its time. Um, and he could be right about that. Um, but he and others will get on with Brexit. I, I don't know the Conservative Party. I mean, none of them. And, and, uh, the problem is that none of our politicians or our bureaucrats or our political media, none of them have ever done a deal in their lives. So they don't understand how in, incredibly strong the United Kingdom's hand is in these negotiations. They don't understand that we have the upper hand in mutual residence because um, there are four million of them living here, 1.2 million of us living there, and we've offered them mutual residence the Christmas before last. And you can see what drives the Commission. Its only ambition in life is to keep the project going. So it turned around to that and said we were making its people into bargaining chips. So on mutual residence, we've got the cards. Um, on trade, we've got the cards, because if we are forced back to the WTO, the World Trade Organization, Instead of continuing with the free trade we already have, they will pay us some 13.5 billion in extra tariffs and we'll pay them five. Thank you very much, profit of eight billion. On security, we're part of the five eyes with you, we'll go on giving them security, which has foiled most of the Muslim plots in, 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 in Europe in recent years. And when they've agreed all of that in the interest of their people, all that is in the interest of the people, okay, of Europe, more than it is in ours, then we should tell them how much money we'll give them. Mm. Instead of which, we've allowed them to do it the other way around. We've allowed them to start demanding 40 billion pounds to allow us out of this wretched thing. And, and what are politicians, but they simply haven't understood what motivates the commission, the bureaucrats, the unelected commission in Brussels, who have the monopoly of proposing all the laws, which then go into a secret body called CODAPA, which argue all the laws, all this in secret, it all comes out, goes to the council of ministers, and then it's law. And there's nothing this place can do about it at all. And it's done nothing about 20,000 laws have been passed like that since we joined. And there's absolutely, I'm thinking of a polite word, um, nothing mm -hmm. this place can do about it. And we never have, and we never will. And so it is, they are vermin. They, they have destroyed our democracy and they are feasting on its carcass. Wow. So the word vermin is absolutely accurate huh. to describe the commission in Brussels. Last question. Thank you so much for your time, <laughs> by the way, and thank you for inviting me no, into, no, into no. the building. It was beautiful. Um, Donald Trump beat more than a dozen primary competitors, and then he beat the entire political media establishment. <laughs> and he did a, a, a number of things that were regarded untouchable before yeah. him. Is there a possibility that a force could arise within the United Kingdom? Is, is that you, Kip? Is there, is, there, is there some way that the European Union could be dashed, that the political correctness can be dashed, that someone can reconnect with Labour voters who have been abandoned by their mm. own leadership? And is Conservative it, voters. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Is, it, is a Trump-like phenomenon even possible here well, or yeah, with yes. the system? I mean, I, I think the referendum out? here well, it predated Trump, but it's the same phenomenon, really. It's real people who have far greater means of communication now, instant communication. Um, they're well educated, they know what's going on. It is the real people rebelling against the political establishment. Um, and looking into the future here, I see the only vehicle for that sort of energy, and we saw quite a lot of the energy this morning outside the Old Bailey and so on. The only vehicle for that is actually a political party, because you can march as much as you... These people have been here for months. Mm. Nobody gives a damn. Um, the marches we have and so on, a million people marched against the Iraq war. Makes no difference at all to these people. We couldn't care less. We sit there in our gilded chamber and in the House of Commons, uh, which is what matters. Uh, the only thing that matters is votes and the only way we're going to change the, um, the, 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 the sort of tendencies that you've just mentioned which are extremely worrying and destructive to our culture um, is through a political party and votes at a general election. Otherwise we're in Rome 400 AD, you know. Mm. This chap Alaric, not a bad fellow, 
got quite a pretty daughter, <laughs> open the gates, yeah. let him, that's where we are, yeah. culturally. Wow. Uh, but, uh, and, and we do have people who will fight it, who have still got the energy. But that energy has to be, I mean, March is a great one, it has to be channeled through a political party. Um, and the only, one, the only one vaguely in sight is UKIP under Gerald Batten's leadership and so on. And um, um, that's the only hope I see. Otherwise, we will go on drifting as we are drifting, and by the time the political establishment wakes up to the threat from Islam, it'll be too late. Mm. We will have riots, mm. no doubt about it. Probably going to have riots anyway in our Muslim, which is what the football lads and the veterans against terror, they all, um, this is the Dutch king arriving. Oh, the Dutch um, king that's all right, God bless him. Um, <laughs> so th that's my answer. If, if, you know, UKIP is the only political vehicle. You know, it's tremendous the work you're doing. I mean, you're talking about all this stuff, you're getting it out there. Mm. Um, but um, you won't find any of this on the BBC yeah, or that's Sky sure. News, or yeah. uh, I'm afraid. Well, I've very much enjoyed our conversation. I, I no. would talk with you all day if I could, but I no, know. No, no. Well, we'll have news, another. We'll and the Dutch King really is. Uh, he's gone through the right other now. door. Yeah, that, that was the fanfare yeah. of trumpets. Yeah, well, what a pleasure to, to meet you in person. And I hope no, we can no. well, keep I in would, touch. No, and we'll follow no, you from nobody, across the pond. We'll follow. We will. We, we, we've got, you've got the same problems. I'm here in London covering Tommy Robinson's contempt of court hearing for all our videos and to chip into our crowdfund campaign to pay for our independent journalism. Please go to TommyTrial.com.